Welcome to Biohacking with Brittany. Thank you so much for listening and tuning in for another week. I am gearing up for Black Friday, Cyber Monday next week. I'm in Canada, so I don't celebrate Thanksgiving over that weekend. We celebrate Thanksgiving in October, but I am definitely looking at things that I've kind of had my eye on, but am waiting for this time to buy. And I typically do this every year. There's just like some big purchases that I kind of wait for. So I kind of wanted to go through actually a couple of things that I'm thinking about. So I mean, obviously I haven't bought anything, so we'll see. And there's definitely mixed reviews on some of these things, but I thought it'd be fun to just talk about them. So I don't think any of them are really health related except for one. And I am looking at getting a new desk chair. The desk chair I have right now is from Ikea and it's so terrible. I've had it for, I think I've had it since 2019. It has no arms on it. It is like, it looks nice because it's very minimalist, but it's so unsupportive. And I get so much shoulder and back pain now from working at my desk every day that I actually don't even work at my desk anymore. I work on my couch because it doesn't trigger as much pain in my shoulders anymore. So I found, I think, a chair that I want. It's from Crate and Barrel. And let me actually, I'll just pull up the exact one so that if you're listening, you know. Let me see, where is it? Okay. So I think it's called Hayworth, the very mesh back desk chair. It's got a long name, but it's super supportive. So it's adjustable in all different ways and it swivels. The height's adjustable. It's on wheels. I think you can get it where the arms are adjustable as well. It's very like cushiony. It's got lower back support and it has a high back. So I'm tall and I need support with my back. So this is what I'm thinking of getting. It's quite pricey. So that's why I'm waiting for Black Friday for it. And I think it's going to make a big difference. I have a standing desk from Ikea as well. It's electronic. So it, you know, you just push a button and it goes up and down, but I really am looking for something that kind of just supports me better and like supports my health better. If you have a chair that you actually recommend and you're like, this is the go-to, this is what you've got to get. It's going to get rid of all of your shoulder and back pain. Please message me before Black Friday, before I buy this, because I would love to actually talk to somebody about this who's tried different chairs and has a recommendation because I feel like this is the type of thing that you would get referred to compared to just buying blindly online and hoping it works out. Please let me know if you have any recommendations. The other things that I'm looking at are definitely not health related, (laughs) but I'll share. So I'm looking at getting the Dyson Airwrap. I you know, my friend is convincing me to get this one. I haven't gotten it yet. I know so many women out there swear by it. I really struggle doing my hair and I would love something that just makes my hair look nicer and doesn't fry it as well. So I highlight my hair and I have naturally actually pretty curly hair. And so anytime you put any type of like what is it, bleach on it to highlight it, it really strips it and makes it more fragile. And it's already fragile because it's curly. So I'm thinking that blow drying my hair instead of using a straightening iron on it will be much better for it. So I'm going to try the Dyson Airwrap. I know a lot of people have this. So, and there's the new one out. So I'm going to try the new one and see how it works. You can buy this if you're interested, you can buy this through Sephora. Now, I'm assuming a lot of people listening to this are Sephora members. I'm a member, I think I'm like the mid-tier one. I know like the discounts are different for Sephora for Black Friday. So we'll see kind of what that is. But right now in Canada, the Dyson Airwrap is sold out at Sephora. So you can't even buy it there anyway. So I'm probably going to just get it directly from Dyson and hope that they have a sale (laughs) on it. Because again, like I... I don't mind paying full price, but whenever October, November comes, I'm like, why would I pay full price when I can just wait a month? I can wait two weeks and just buy it for Black Friday and get like 30% off. You know what I mean? Like it just doesn't make sense. So I just wait now. And then the other thing I'm looking at is, oh, these are just lame. (laughs) 
<laughs> I have a list, but I'll tell you anyway, I'm getting a new pet dog bed for my dog. And there's also a necklace that I want for Missouri that is hundred percent gold. So obviously it's expensive. So that's what I'm looking at as well. I hope that you're looking at things too. Again, like, I mean, even for like expensive health tools, like biohacking stuff, like I think if I didn't have some things, like things that I would invest in, you know, Black Friday biohacking wise would probably be things like a red light therapy device or a sauna or sauna blanket, that type of thing, like the big purchases because they are marked down probably the most that they will ever be marked down. I already have this stuff, so I don't like really necessarily need it, but that's what I would recommend to you. Of course, all of the brands that I work with are also having Black Friday sales. So it's honestly, it's a really great time to like stock up on supplements as well. And you know, anything like that, like even the sponsors for today's show, which includes like Viome. I know Viome is doing a big Black Friday sale as well. And they do all sorts of testing, right? So they do gut microbiome testing, oral microbiome testing, and they also test your blood. And so they have a sale next week. I guess that's starting, although some people have started early, but there's a starting next week. And you can use my discount code Biohacking Brittany for that one. Same with Bioptimizers. They're doing their biggest sale ever next week. That's 25% off the entire store, the entire website, and that starts on the 21st. And again, you can use my discount code for that, which is Biohacking Brittany, and it's in all capitals linked on my show notes. And last but not least, Sensate. I feel like, honestly, guys, like, if you're going to buy biohacking stuff, this is the time to do it. This is the time to invest in your wellness. Again, just because these are probably the lowest prices you're ever going to see. And as somebody who works with these brands directly and offers discounts to people all of the time, I still don't ever see prices as low as these. So same with Sensei. Again, I have a discount code biohacking Brittany. Feel free to go for it and try it out. And you can always return things, right? If you don't like it. So it's worth the investment. I feel like my voice sounds really croaky today and I actually lost my voice over the weekend. So that is probably why. Usually it's not this deep and sounds like a frog, but anyway. And I wanted to read a review recently that I got. So this one I love. It says it's titled On Point Week In and Week Out, five stars. And it says, Brittany consistently serves up the latest information on biohacking one's entire lifestyle. She's a thoroughly modern muse with a penchant, whatever that means, for finding the latest and greatest for peak performance. Britt is charming, smart, and able to get the best guests on her show a must listen. Thank you so much, Sassy Bratton, for that one. I really appreciate it, and I read all of your reviews, and they do mean a lot to me. So enjoy this episode as we dive into women's health, which is, you know, my favorite topic to talk about. And I really, yeah, I really enjoyed this one. We got into all sorts of things PCOS, endometriosis, menopause, bioidentical hormones, biohacks for these things, different products. Like we talked, we actually talked about a lot. And I really appreciate Dr. Suzanne's approach at her practice in New York City because it's just very refreshing and doesn't happen very often. So thank you for tuning in and stay tuned for another episode next week. And a reminder that my holiday campaign is launching December 1st and I am giving away a lot of products, everybody, like a lot, like 12 days of biohacking giveaways. Can you believe that? 12 days. That's a lot of products I'm giving away. So get ready. You could win everything from, oh my gosh, at-home tests to supplements to air purifiers to different face creams. Like there's a bunch of things coming. So stay tuned. Those giveaways will be posted on my Instagram account. And if you are on my newsletter list, you will also be notified as well. And of course on the podcast too. So stay tuned. And I really, really excited for that. And you guys are going to love it. And I can't wait for 12 of you to win over the Christmas season. Maybe you'll keep it for yourself or maybe you'll give it to a loved one. So enjoy and I will catch you next week. 
Welcome to another episode of Biohacking with Brittany. Today, we are talking all things women's health, which is honestly my favorite topic and really what got me on my own journey is my own female health struggles. But before we get into any of that, I want to introduce our guest. So we have Dr. Suzanne Vensky joining us. She is a MD and she founded a New York City based holistic gynecology practice. It's called Tara MD. So welcome to the show. I can't wait to hear all about it. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Great. So I saw, you know, when I was going through your website that you treat a lot of different women's health issues from all ages, from healing hormonal imbalances to pelvic pain, to endometriosis, and all of these different things. But before we kind of get into, I guess, what your day-to-day looks like, I'm really curious as to why you decided to start this practice in the first place. Yeah. So I actually, and this is you know not to put this down, but I felt that in my field, in OBGYN, obstetrics gets a lot of attention. When you're pregnant, you get a lot of attention, which is wonderful needed, but that I felt during gyneco- when for gynecological issues in general, it sort of becomes less of a focus for a lot of women. And I had had an academic practice beforehand and decided to open up this practice because I sort of was pursuing my passion and I'm double boarded in integrative medicine and OBGYN, and then also trained in functional medicine and really wanted to approach women's health issues and focus on the health issues that, you know, most people don't focus on and really treat it comprehensively from all angles. So that's why I opened the practice. And my, my ideal was to have, you know, sort of this approach with multiple different modalities under one roof and really being able to approach women's healthcare using traditional medicines and surgeries, but also using evidence-based modalities that are in the more integrative space and functional space as well. Yeah, I really appreciate that. And it's honestly really rare to come across practices and clinics like yours. I've seen a few others in the States. I don't think I've seen anything like yours here in Vancouver in Canada. And that's why I appreciate it so much because I think it is important to have holistic ways of healing and and have more maybe natural ways of healing, but you also bring the medical aspect to it. So you also have such a like education and background in using pharmaceuticals and things that are so common in the West, but you also bring this almost like Eastern side to it. And I really just love how you bring that together. And so I'm sure your patients just like see so much success with that combination. Yeah, I think that I think it's I think it's integral. Part of the issue that I saw when I was um, I had done my first fellowship in laparoscopic and robotic surgery and was doing a lot of surgery on women and especially women with endometriosis and also fibroids and felt that I was doing these surgeries for endometriosis. A lot of women were having repeat surgeries, you know, multiple surgeries in their life for their endometriosis, and it just sort of felt like you're missing what's going on. There's got to be more to the story. Why are we not focusing on what they're putting in their body? What are they doing for stress management? What are they doing for exercise? Their sleep, right? Because sleep is really restorative to the body. So optimizing all of these things and really focusing on all of the aspects to be able to make a woman actually heal and to feel balanced. Yeah, exactly. It's very biohacky of you. (laughs) (laughs) To think about it through that lens, which I love. So for women who come to you, let's say they're in their 20s and 30s, we'll start there. What are the typical health issues that are just trending and just very common in the last like five years or however long? In 20s and 30s, I will say that that PCOS has been a very common complaint that I've seen in that age group, and it really comes to light usually in that age group. And uh, endometriosis becomes another one. So PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome, is kind of a conglomerate of multiple symptoms of things, endocrinology-based as well as gynecologically-based. A lot of women will report having irregular periods, also having some symptoms possibly of male pattern baldness, hair loss, growing hair where they don't want to grow hair, weight gain. And that w- that's been one big one that I've seen. Then obviously endometriosis usually rears its ugly head in the 20s. I think that this is often delayed in diagnosis, you know, up to seven to different years it takes to diagnose endometriosis. So it's really quite sad that you have a woman actually complaining about these issues, usually in the early 20s, and then don't get diagnosed until probably 30s or late 20s with that issue. 
And then you always get just, you know, in general, right? A lot of women want to know what contraception to use. And a lot of women want to know alternative options to contraception and don't want to be on the birth control pill or want to be on something. And I think it's really important to meet a person where they are and and to not, you know, dictate what they should be doing with their body, but to educate so that they can make the choices that they want with their body. Mm, Yeah. Yeah, definitely. That's really interesting. So how would you describe the difference between endometriosis and PCOS? Yeah. So endometriosis is a condition that is basically based in estrogen and inflammation and it's multifactorial. There's definitely a genetic component to it. And essentially it's when the lining of the uterus grows in areas outside the uterus. So often they'll form ovarian cysts that the cyst contents is really endometrial tissue, or it'll just be on the peritoneum. So the peritoneum is this tissue layer that we have lining the entire inside cavity of our abdomen and it'll implant there. What happens is that endometriosis is this vicious, vicious circle. So essentially you get this growth of the implants and then the implants themselves actually secrete estrogen and actually create this environment of inflammation and create cytokines and so on for that. So usually what women will say is that they have painful periods. And I always tell women that no one's period is lovely, right? It's not the most enjoyable time of your month. But if you are missing work, missing school, missing events, not wanting to go to go to a party or go to an event or go to you, out with your friends when you have your period because the pain is really unbearable or you really feel that way, then you really have to start thinking for yourself that it might be endometriosis. So that's a disease of estrogenation when the, in, when the lining of the uterus implants in other places in the abdomen. And I've seen it everywhere. I've seen it implant into the nose. And I had one patient who came in every single month with nosebleeds. I've seen it implant in the lung, in the lung cavity. And I had a couple of patients actually who would have catamenial thorax, pneumothorax, where basically their lungs would collapse because blood was in the lung cavity during that time. PCOS is a very different bird. You know, it's actually kind of more of an endocrinology type of issue, but I think it falls into gynecology because of the skipping of periods. And there's lots of different forms of PCOS because most people have this stereotypical idea of what PCOS is. And if a woman comes in and she doesn't kind of fit into that stereotype, then it's often goes underdiagnosed as well. But again, that's more of an issue of both of them. The similarity is that they are estrogen based issues. With PCOS, often the body's not producing enough progesterone to balance out the estrogen and to make the cycles be normal. Yeah, I like I I ask because I've gone through my own journey, which I kind of alluded to, of kind of exactly what you said. Of I had one gynecologist think I had PCOS and I didn't match all of the symptoms and I wasn't like the typical picture of somebody who has PCOS. So they didn't actually diagnose me and they kept just running labs and tests and all of them kind of came back normal, but I had like weird symptoms. And so it was kind of this whole, it was pretty exhausting to be totally frank. Like it was pretty exhausting. And if I wasn't somebody who was in the health field who knew how to heal holistically and knew about biohacking, like I probably would have walked away and ignored it until it came up and I had to deal with it again. And so I can understand women going through this, even endometriosis, like you saying, like it takes seven to 10 years to actually get a diagnosis of that. That's insane. That's a very, very long time to deal with like very upsetting and sometimes debilitating symptoms. Like why does it take so long to get a diagnosis? Yeah, absolutely. And then you go down this rabbit hole because when you have these delays, like you had gone through it, I had actually listened to your podcast that I loved healing ovaries, healing my ovaries. Oh yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So yeah, you know, you go down this rabbit hole. Unfortunately, a lot of these women do that where they're not getting the diagnosis. They then think it's in their head. It starts to impact their life, their sleep, all other aspects of them. So it's very, it really is kind of unacceptable, right? That it takes that long to get these diagnoses. Yeah. Would you say that the root cause of PCOS and endometriosis is the same. Like obviously like the hormones are acting differently in the body. There's imbalances, but if we take a step back further, like why are there hormonal dis like dysregulations and problems in the first place? And is it directly related or is it 
I guess, is it because of like our lifestyle and our food? What would you say is the root cause of both of those issues? Endometriosis, I think, you know, is a combination. It really does have a genetic component to it as well, because why would we implant these? The lining of the uterus should be in the lining of the uterus and it shouldn't be implanting in other places. So as for that, it's, it's a little bit different. I do think that they both kind of share the, and I don't love using this term, but I'm going to use this term, sort of this estrogen dominant picture is what they both share. And actually, similarly, fibroids have a similar look in that respect, too. I think that's an excellent question. I'm not certain why. And why so often it's progesterone, right? It's not estrogen that becomes the issue in hormonal balances often until, unless you're talking about later perimenopause, when obviously there's estrogen deficiency. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I just think about these things because obviously when it's personal, you care a lot more about it. And so I've just thought about, yeah, cellular dysfunction, detoxing dysfunction, mitochondria dysfunction, like how granular do we have to go in order to actually figure out what is causing this in the first place? And then I also think about, this is like such a tangent, but I also think about when did it actually start, right? So like, of course, there's a genetic component, which you're talking about for endometriosis. But if we talk about PCOS and we assume that there's no genetic component to it, or maybe you know, not a strong genetic component, then if the symptoms start showing up, let's say mid twenties, did the dysfunction actually start in the twenties or actually did it start when you first got your period at 13 and it just didn't actually show up for 10 years? No, that's an excellent point. I do think that more and more PCOS has a genetic component too, because I, I can't tell you how many women I've seen. And when you dig deeper, their mothers also had PCOS, even though it was it was undiagnosed. So I do think there's more to the story there. But I actually think that we're gonna what we're gonna find out is that there's you know more than one etiology or more than one reason because there are things that you had mentioned that I agree with. I think that you know our environment maybe somebody who doesn't have a predilection for PCOS right or predetermined nature for PCOS gets PCOS because of the endocrine disruptors that exist in the environment and the poor, you know, standard American diet that they're consuming as well, too, because all of these factors obviously influence estrogen metabolism, too, right? So I do think that we're going to find out that there's kind of a, for PCOS specifically, that that there's multiple different, A, we know there's multiple different types of PCOS, right? And I think we're going to find out there's multiple different causes of PCOS also. Would you like to dramatically improve the quality of your sleep? Would you like to bulletproof your stress? Please listen to the end because there is a Black Friday special offer happening and this could be exactly what you need. I've got a few more questions for you. Are you irritable, anxious? Do you struggle with insomnia? Experience cramps or twitches? Are you constipated sometimes? There are dozens of symptoms of magnesium deficiency. So these are just a few of the common ones that I've seen. Four out of five Americans are magnesium deficient and almost everyone has suboptimal levels. And that's a big problem because magnesium is involved in more than 600 biochemical reactions in your body. Now, here's what most people don't know. Taking just any magnesium supplement won't solve your problem because most supplements use the cheapest kinds that your body can't use or absorb. That's why I exclusively recommend Magnesium Breakthrough. It's the only sub- only <laughs> it's the only full spectrum magnesium supplement with seven unique forms of magnesium that your body can use and absorb. And I literally use this every night. Like I think I take two at night and I also take more when I'm stressed as well, because it's just so helpful in really calming me down, making my body feel better. Also really great for muscle tension and back tension, back pain, all of that. They have seven different types in this. It's a very holistic supplement, which is why I love it. The makers of this magnesium supplement, Bioptimizers, are having an incredible Black Friday special offer from November 21st to 29th. So write that in your calendar right now. Dot, jot that down, jot that down. (laughs) They are doing 25% off their entire store. So not just magnesium breakthrough. It's all of their digestive enzymes, their probiotics. They also have a parasite um, herbal cleanse that I've done. They have tons of products. So it's only during that one week, like Black Friday time, that you get 25% off. And this is their biggest sale that they do all year. 
which is wild. So I'm going to go take a look and see what I'm going to get. You can get this by going to www.bioptimizers.com slash biohacking Brittany, and you can enter my discount code biohacking Brittany in all capitals to get 25% off. This is linked on my website. This is linked in the show notes. It's basically everywhere. But if you forget and November 21st comes, send me a message on Instagram and I can send you the link. I can send you the discount. No big deal at all. But I really suggest you write this down because I don't know, this might be while supplies last. I guess we're going to find out. So that's November 21st to 29th, Biohacking Brittany in all capitals for 25% off everything, including the best magnesium supplement that is out there. Yeah, I agree with that. I think if there's different types, then it makes sense that there would be different causes. I haven't, to be honest, I haven't heard a lot of people talk about the different types of PCOS. I only found out about the different types, I think like six months ago, like very recently when I was doing further research into this, trying to understand my own cycle and trying to understand why I can have some of the symptoms of PCOS, but I don't present with all of them. And like my inflammation is fine and uh, my fasting glucose is fine and these other things. But then if you look at something like adrenal PCOS, which is very much stress related, then I'm like, oh, okay, maybe I do relate to this <laughs> because this kind of, I actually am prone to being stressed out for long periods of time. So Yeah, I think with PCOS, it's tough because I don't think there's any black and white answers right now necessarily. And it's almost like it's a spectrum and we're still learning. Mm -hmm. I think it's, you know, I like to use this analogy. I think it's the IBS of gynecology. Mm. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah. that makes sense. (laughs) Right? Not quite certain. We're going to throw it in this category. We know that down the line, there's going to be a lot more information in this category. But for now, this is the junk category that we're going to throw it into. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting actually that you say that a lot of women, their mothers might have it, but they might not know because I asked my mother and she said she didn't, she didn't even know what it was and let alone her mother knowing what it was. Right. But that actually doesn't mean that they didn't have it. That just means like no one ever told them they never got diagnosed. It wasn't as common like knowledge as it is today. So, I mean, that definitely makes me think differently about it for sure. Yeah. I think that back in the day, right. So to speak, if you didn't have that classic picture, you know, kind of like what you went through, right. But when you picture, there's no way it's going to be thought about. And I don't think that it was diagnosed. I think that for the most part, a lot of these issues are blown off, but a lot of women that I've spoken to have said that, oh yeah, my mother said she went, she had some issues with her period and she was skipping periods or, you know, my mother always had problems with her periods and then she had problems getting pregnant, you know? So there's always these things that kind of point toward just not a missed diagnosis. Yeah, absolutely. So for women in their forties and fifties, what do you commonly see in your practice? Yeah. So unfortunately, this is where perimenopause and fibroids really do rear their ugly head. I see a lot of, you know, I also see kind of universally 20s and 30s going back is also there is some issues with like vestibulodynia that I see often too. And sometimes it's actually birth control induced vestibulodynia. So vestibulodynia or pain with intercourse and really focused on dysfunction of the vestibule, which is the entrance to the vagina. That kind of carries through a little bit into 40s and 50s. It can, because there's kind of different, again, with PCOS, different types of vestibulodynia or causes of it, really. Then 40s and 50s, you know, often during this time, fibroids become a bigger issue. And these are these non, non-cancerous benign tumors that grow that are made of the muscle of the uterus. And they can grow in different locations, and that kind of impacts what the symptoms are regarding fibroids. But they do tend to grow more during the 40s, less of an issue in the 50s, because, you know, the average age of menopause is 51. And the cure for fibroids and endometriosis and all of these sort of estrogen-mediated diseases is menopause. But that's very common. And then perimenopause becomes an issue in the 40s and 50s. And there's different stages of perimenopause. You know, there's obviously things that I don't think that most people even realize that there's, you know, an early perimenopause where you're still getting your period regularly, but all of a sudden having, you know, terrible, terrible PMS that you didn't have beforehand and just periods can get heavier all of a sudden, cycles can get shorter. And a lot of, you know, 
a lot of mood issues that come around with it too. Difficulty losing weight where you were doing the things you normally would do with diet and exercise and still not able to lose weight and weight's coming on. And these are kind of some perimenopausal changes that happen. And I see a lot of women who are really, thankfully, I guess, a little more in tune where they're like, this is definitely hormonally mediated. The way that I feel just doesn't make sense. And then later on, more towards the later 40s and early 50s, we start seeing those that late perimenopause, which is by skipping periods. And we know that normal menopause is anywhere between 40 and 60. So even though I'm using these kind of rough ages, you can extrapolate that like this may even pop up in the 30s, right? If you're someone who's going to go through menopause a little bit earlier, that those are the common issues and gynecological issues that I do see in 40s and 50s. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. What is the difference between like, just for everyone listening, like what is the difference between fibroids and cysts? And if you have cysts at one point, does that mean you're going to have fibroids or are they totally like unrelated? Yeah. When we talk about cysts, we're usually talking about ovarian cysts. So different anatomical structure. This is where the cysts can grow on the ovaries. And there's lots of different types of cysts that can grow. Unfortunately, I'm sure many of us have had at some point in our lives, you know, an ovulatory type cyst. So a cyst that formed when you ovulate an egg and then kind of just bled into that area and created this, this cyst, even though it's more not a real cyst because there's no actual cyst wall around it. But those are in the ovary. And then there's multiple different types of cysts too. I had mentioned endometriomas, which are cysts really only for women who have endometriosis. And fibroids grow in the uterus. And that's because they are smooth muscle tumors. And it does not mean that if you have fibroids, you're going to have cysts. Or if you have cysts, you're going to have fibroids because there's so many different types of cysts. Right. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. And I think that like clarification actually helps a lot. So for women who, I guess like at any age, really, like depending on what you're dealing with, but what is your stance on using bioidentical hormones? Maybe specifically like when you're getting into menopause and that type of thing. Yeah. I mean, always, I think that we have the options and I think that just, I'm going to answer. Yes. You should always use bioidentical hormones, but I do want to sort of clarified to people that I think a, there's a misperception that bioidentical means compounded. And we have FDA approved, meaning that you can get them with a prescription, like, like a regular pharmacy covered by your insurance, FDA approved bioidentical hormones. And I think that it makes complete sense that we put back in our body, the hormones that we create from our body, right? For, for an alternative on the market is actually that women use a synthetic hormone that's actually gotten from horse urine, right? So the issue with this, of course, is that you're putting now horse estrogen in your body. And there's many, many, many more types of estrogen that a horse makes than a human makes. So we only make, right, three main types of estrogen. There is a period of time, very brief, in the fetal life period where E4 or estetrol is made. Otherwise, we make E1, E2, E3. So why would you put, right, estrogens in your body that are not, that are foreign to your body? And I think that as long as we have that knowledge that bioidentical, right, which means that usually it's plant derived and it mimics the exact structure of the hormones that we create. But if we have FDA approved bioidenticals, there's really no reason not to use bioidenticals. And there's FDA approved bioidentical progesterone hormone as well. The interesting thing that's coming out is now there's actually a new birth control in the market that's using a bioidentical estrogen. The progestin is still synthetic. And progestin is a, the term progestin means synthetic progesterone. Wow, that is certainly interesting about the birth control. That's a big change. So for people who have PCOS or anything where progesterone is lower, even if they are in their fertile years, let's say, would you recommend taking bioidentical hormones? I think that if the progesterone's low and you're in the fertile years, you have multiple options. So I think that definitely bioidentical progesterone is one option for management. If, you know, if a woman also wants contraception, then, you know, I think that that we still have to realize that there is a time and a place for birth control pills to be used as well if contraception's necessary and no alternative method is is okay. And then there are some supplements that can be used if to help naturally elevate a woman's progesterone 
if they didn't want to go either either route, right? Otherwise. Yeah, exactly. I find it interesting because I had my gynecologist a couple of years ago recommend taking bioidentical progesterone at the time. And I think I did it for like one cycle and then I stopped because honestly, it felt like a bit of a band-aid approach to fixing what was going on. And I wasn't sure if I was okay, like taking it every cycle and that type of thing. But I do see the time and place for it when you've exhausted all other remedies and healing options. I definitely can see how it would be helpful for sure. Yeah. I think that all comes down to what each person needs and wants, right? Yeah, exactly. Do you ever feel frazzled, not grounded, stressed, and like you have way too much on your plate? Of course, you know you should be taking time for self-care, but it doesn't mean you actually are, and it kind of just feels like another thing on your to-do list. I have definitely been there. It's tough to kind of balance everything these days, especially for those of us working from home with extra side hustles and or kids. Stress reduction feels like a nice idea, but never something easily achievable in the moments when we need it the most. I believe in solutions that use science to help us be healthier on a daily basis, but without crazy technology or tools that aren't accessible or affordable for everybody. I use Sensate, which is something that I've been using for a long time now, and I spoke about a lot last year, which is a groundbreaking innovation in wellness technology that uses the natural power of sonic resonance to calm your body's nervous system, providing immediate immediate, let me tell you, relief and long-term benefits from regular regular use. It calms your nerves and helps you feel better in as few as 10 minutes per day. It improves stress resilience to help you cope with whatever life throws at you. And it increases heart rate variability, a known biomarker of health and longevity. This is so important because for many of us, our body's built-in stress management system is simply just an overdrive. Sensate's novel patented technology was designed to send infrasonic waves through the chest to reach the vagus nerve that sits deep in the core of our nervous system. By speaking to our body's command center, we can control how we respond to all the positive and negative things that we experience each day, which is just so cool and such an easy, easy biohack to bring in every day. You can use my discount code, which is biohacking Brittany in all capitals. Um, I will put the link in the show notes and it's on my shop page at biohackingbrittany.com and you get $25 off today. If you have any questions about it or when you get it, please message me. I'd love to chat as this is one of my favorite biohacking tools to use on a regular basis. So when uh, someone comes into your clinic or your practice And obviously you give them all of these options and you talk them through kind of their lifestyle and their diet. Where do you recommend like women start? Because I think healing in general and like holistic health and wellness is pretty overwhelming, I think, for the average person. So where do you recommend that they start in order to, I guess, like see the most results to help their balance their female hormones? So I think that what's really important is actually lifestyle in balancing hormones, first and foremost you know, kind of like what you alluded to, we can do things and give hormones and do this and do that. But ultimately it kind of is a bandaid, which is not necessarily a bad thing, right? But it's kind of a bandaid. So I think that the best place to start is really to look from a lifestyle perspective. So optimization. And I think that this is, these are things that are more tangible to, to women as well to kind of get on top of. So nutrition is super important, especially when it comes to hormones And I think that that's the first place I probably would say direct your attention and focus and research and look to is the nutrition, right? Because from so many perspectives to the the types of, you know, meat you're putting in your body and the hormones you're putting in your body from what you're consuming from food intake can affect everything, right? And then obviously looking at just in general, you know, the effects of the processed foods, the chemicals and so on, and the impact they have on hormones. I think it's pretty difficult to balance out hormones without balancing out nutrition and optimizing nutrition. So I probably would start from that aspect for balancing. And then of course, you know, a close second runner up is to really focus in on sleep too, right? There's just no way to really get hormones balanced without 
having adequate rest and allowing your body to restore and reset. And then ultimately looking, you know, if you, when you're ready to go down the rabbit hole with us, right? So ultimately really looking at, and you would, you've you alluded to this on your podcast too, but really looking at kind of endocrine disruptors and what you're putting on your, that can be giving you exogenous hormones or acting like estrogen and throwing off your hormones too. Yeah, I would agree with like what you said. I think starting with nutrition is probably the easiest place to start and also the most impactful. I don't think there's any point in necessarily buying any supplements or really swapping things until you've cleaned up your diet, you know, and you've consistently done it as well. Not just like here and there, you've kind of made healthy swaps. Like that's obviously a good place to start, but it's really, for me personally, I I found, and even when I was seeing clients is like, you really, really get the benefits when you stick to it week in and week out and month in and month out. And it kind of becomes your lifestyle. Obviously, like there's something to be said about balance and like having a good time and, and not being too restrictive as well. But I really think with balancing hormones, like the, there's this like fine line of overindulgence can really, really mess up your hormones and kind of put you back where you started. What are your favorite biohacks to recommend to clients? Oh my goodness. From like tips and tools and fun little gadgets. Yeah. 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 I mean, I actually love, and I have no relations with any of these companies. I do love Sensate. I think it's a great way. You know, I, I'm constantly getting women who are like, I just can't meditate. I just can't meditate. And I totally get it. And I remember playing with this, a functional neurotherapist actually introduced me to it. And mm-hmm. I thought it was the most amazing thing. So I do like that. I like to use that for my own for meditation and then to recommend it to people who think they can't do it to at least get some meditation in because I do believe meditation is incredibly important. Nice. Yeah. I love the Sense8. I use it quite a lot as well. And I have so many as well. Like even the aura, aura Ring, I think is great. Red Light Therapy is great. There's so many now and like the biohacking market in general is really exploding. So it's cool to see... I guess like more women really just take this on and use these products as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. We need more. Mm -hmm. (laughs) More focus on women's health ones too. Yes, exactly. Exactly. So if you were to create a, like, I know you have a practice, but if you were to create a physical product for women's health, what would it be? Like, what do you kind of see it in like the market, like a gap in the market, or do you have any ideas? I'm just like so curious because you're such an expert. I just want to pick your brain. (laughs) Oh my gosh. I have so many. I have a list of when I get more time of things I want to create essentially. But so problem-based by problem-based, I would say that for women who experience pelvic pain and maybe specific to the pelvic floor muscles or endometriosis, lots of different reasons why you can have pelvic pain, even, you know, painful bladder syndrome. I think it'd be really great to have a tool that's essentially kind of like a heating pad that's a essentially like a vaginal dilator that's placed vaginally to really heat up and relax, right? Because, you know, it's great when you put a heating pad externally, but I feel like you would get more from having it internally. So that's one of my things I'm going to try to work on at some point. Cool. Oh my gosh, it's a huge list that I have. I would open my phone and go through with you. (laughs) (laughs) That's awesome. But yeah, I would say that in, I think that that now there's a lot more coming to light. I think that people are really tapping into perimenopause and bringing that to light because there's been a huge gap in that care for a really long time. And I do think that there's more and more kind of, you know, startup companies now coming out, really focusing in on perimenopause, getting at least the language going in that space, which I think is great. I would love more technology and tools to be created for management of pain and to, and especially for management of, of as I've mentioned, vestibulodynia. Because right now, it's sort of so difficult right now to get that under control for women. And it's a horrible way for women to live their lives. Mm. Yeah. Do you, I find that really interesting in general. And I was actually going to ask previously, you said something about, we were talking, like you were talking about pelvic pain and you talked about painful sex. How do you know, like, how would a woman know if pain she's feeling is like, problematic enough for it to be a bigger issue versus like, this is just uncomfortable. It's fine. I'll get over it. Do you know what I mean? Like, 
how do you, and I speak from my own experience and from other girlfriends I've talked to, like, how do you know when it's like, oh no, this is like a medical concern? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I think that, you know, that there are certain positions and certain times when intercourse can be uncomfortable, especially depending on kind of the partner to partner connection and anatomy in general. But I think that if you're persistently having pain with sex, whether it's pain on insertion, so just at the entrance when first you feel it. And one of the signs of that being an issue too would be that if you are someone who uses tampons, also having pain with tampon use, or if you're someone who wears, you know, jeans, feeling pain with just wearing jeans, basically, because it rubs up against the outside, then those are things that are not normal. And definitely you should see a doctor about that. If you're consistently having pain that's deep, with intercourse or pain that you feel after orgasm, then again, not normal and should definitely be evaluated. Are you always feeling bloated after you eat? Is your body aging faster than it should be? Are you feeling anxious or having trouble focusing? Are you tired all of the time? I think we've all felt these things at one point, but addressing the root cause instead of just the symptoms is tough And it's hard to kind of figure out what the root cause is. Your microbiome and your cells play a critical role in the way you feel and your body's resilience to stress and aging. Your gut microbiome can be considered the chief architect of your health with trillions of microbes in your gut, helping you digest food, absorb nutrients, maintain a healthy weight, neutralize toxins, and fight off bad bacteria. Your digestive system also begins in your mouth. And it's actually often the first line of defense against pathogens. When your cells are functioning optimally, they produce enough energy to sustain your needs and are efficiently cleaning up cellular waste like free radicals. Viome provides an in-depth test that looks at all of this. They look at your gut microbiome, your oral microbiome, and your cellular health. They use cutting edge mRNA technology and an AI powered platform that helps give different health scores and recommendations based on your test results. They kind of connect the dots on in between what is happening internally and what you are experiencing yourself. I highly suggest trying Viome if you are having symptoms that are persisting and you're kind of at a standstill and you don't really know where to go with your health anymore. I just got retested and I'm so excited to share my results very soon when they come in. I would do the full test, the gut microbiome, the oral microbiome, and the cellular health so you can get a full picture of what's going on with you right now. Obviously, I have a discount code for you guys. It's Biohacking Brittany in all capitals for 15% off. This is actually more than they offer on their website, so it's definitely worth using this code. You can find Viome on my online store at biohackingbrittany.com or linked in my shop on my Instagram account, which is at biohackingbrittany. So again, try Viome and use my discount code biohackingbrittany in all capitals today. Yeah, no, for sure. That makes a lot of sense. Though I've never even thought about those types of things in terms of, you know, pain from a tampon, pain after an orgasm, like that, that's really significant and definitely a red flag or like a flag that something's going on and that you really do need to see somebody. Have you ever tried castor oil packs or do you ever recommend them? So I'd heard your podcast about it. I'm going to say that I actually learned something from you. I'm actually not familiar with castor oil packs. Yeah. I, it's interesting because I just started on my previous cycle that I just finished I just started doing them regularly. And this has been something that a naturopath recommended to me like 12 years ago, like so long ago, and I didn't do them. And then I started doing them regularly because I was having ovary pain. Yeah, you listen to my podcast, you know, and I was doing them daily and it actually made a big difference. Like the cycle I just had was 38 days, which is still longer than I want it to be. However, much shorter than cycles I've had in the last year. And so I was actually really excited about 38 days, but I've also been doing other things as well to help like acupuncture. I'm taking Chinese herbs right now. So I've really kind of like broadened how I've been going about healing my ovaries and my cycle. And it's been interesting to see the results. And like my period that I just had was much lighter, much less pain. Yeah. And it's so interesting. So I 
Because I, I'm thinking about physical products as I grow my business. And one of the things that I really see like a lack of on the market is castor oil packs and castor oil in general. And I would love, I mean, I'm just giving all my ideas away, but <laughs> <laughs> me too, apparently. <laughs> um, yeah. I would love for there to be a castor oil that actually has herbs in it that have been scientifically proven to support either pain relief or the menstrual cycle, because when you're putting the castor oil on your womb, like that's soaking directly into the tissue. So you might as well add herbs in there that are supportive and just like elevate and like stack, (laughs) stack the hacks. You know what I mean? So it's like something I've been thinking about. (laughs) Yeah. Yes. It's incredibly interesting. Yeah, it is. Do you ever recommend red light therapy for pelvic pain or anything like that? I do. Yeah, absolutely. It's definitely one of the options that I include in management. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right now I use like, I have different red light therapy devices, but someone told me, and you actually might know, someone told me that there is a company that has created a red light therapy device specifically for the womb in general. Yes. Yes. Okay. So you know of it. Okay, great. (laughs) So actually I have it in my office. (laughs) Oh my gosh. Okay. So there is actually, it's near, inf- near infrared light actually therapy that's used. And I love, I love the idea that this is, you know, technology that's not new, right? It's not innovative technology. It's been proven it works. And I do, I, I, as opposed to rushing to do surgery, I use it on a lot of women and for a lot of different causes, right? For endometriosis, for pelvic floor myalgia, which is, you know, pain in the pelvic floor muscles, for painful bladder syndrome and And just general pelvic pain. And it works really, really well, actually. That's awesome. What's the name of that company? Do you know? Yeah, that's called Sola, S-O-L-A, Sola Pelvic Therapy. Okay, I'm going to look into that. And I'll link it in the show notes. Yeah, because like I said, like I just use a red light therapy device and I kind of alternate. You know, one night will be a castor oil pack. The next night will be red light therapy. And it's pretty profound how healing it is and how much it can help with your cycle and menstrual pain or pelvic pain. Like I've noticed such a difference. Right. And again, you know, this is what athletes use this all the time, right? (laughs) For muscle recovery. So why not us? Yeah, exactly. I think that's what I like in general that I'm seeing right now is like, we're taking these things that were once only for athletes or only for people, you know, let's say very well off or whatever you want to call them. And there's companies out there creating devices that are for the average person who they can use at home and get results as well, which is just awesome. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's same with like levels coming out. I'm sure, you know, levels. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Blood glucose management. Have you Mm -hmm. you tried? I actually have, uh, that's my plan actually for the month of January. I wanted to kind of do at least one month of seeing it. I, I am so, I love it. I love the technology of it. I love the idea of it. I love the data. I'm a big data person, right? So I think it's a fantastic idea. Have you used it? No, I haven't. I should. I don't know if it's actually available in Canada. The last time I talked to them, I had there's like a roundabout way I had to go about doing it in Canada. But I mean, they're growing and they're launching and doing all of these wonderful things. So for anyone listening who doesn't know, Levels, they have CGMs, which is a continuous glucose monitor. And you can stick it in your body. I think most people stick it in their arms, but I think you can also stick it in your legs, was it? Or it's somewhere else. But regardless, it helps you monitor your glucose. So you kind of know how your food is impacting you and how your lifestyle is impacting your glucose levels. So you can make healthier choices, essentially. Yeah. And it really, it really focuses in on how we're each individually so different in our response to food, right? Like you can have you know, oatmeal and I can have oatmeal and what our bodies respond to it is so drastically different. So it really allows you to get a lot of data information about yourself, even specific to foods that you think are healthy and fine for you, right? But may not be good for you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, I definitely need to play around with it because I feel like it's like such a biohacker tool. So I definitely, I'm sure I will next year, just like you are. And yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. I actually was going to be one of my holiday gifts. Nice. (laughs) Yes. That's awesome. That's such a great idea. So we can do it together and compare. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> compare results. <laughs> well, thank you so much for coming on the show. This was so great. If people want to work with you, where can they go and how can they connect with you? So we're www.tarahmd.com. 
facebook.com. And then on Insta, it's Tara MD, the number four women. And thank you so much for having me today. I really appreciate it. It's been wonderful. Yeah, of course. Awesome. So I will connect all of that in the show notes. And so anyone can find you and hopefully work with you, especially if they are in New York City. Thank you. Thanks for listening to another episode of Biohacking with Brittany. If you're interested in finding the show notes or the sponsors for this episode, you can do so on my website, which is biohackingbrittany.com. Remember to follow me on Instagram where I'm most active. My handle is at biohackingbrittany. And if you're interested in working together and you want to email me directly, you can do that. My email is info at biohackingbrittany.com. And I look forward to hearing from you and having you tune in next week.